Hello, everybody, and good evening. Welcome to the Nine Arches event, the for National Poetry Day. We are here for the New Romantics Poetry Salon. So welcome to everybody just joining us. I'm just going to wait for everybody to um, join us in the space here online, and then we'll begin in just a moment. So I think we have all of our poets, which is absolutely wonderful. So good evening, everybody. Um, absolutely thrilled to be um, joining you tonight for our lovely New Romantics Poetry Cabaret. So in true cabaret style, we have our lights on, we have a beautiful atmosphere, we have our wonderful entertainers for this evening. So. Without further ado, we're absolutely thrilled to be here tonight, broadcasting live into your living rooms from our various locations around the country and around the Midlands. And we're especially delighted to be the opening event for this year's Birmingham Literature Festival. So, my name's Jane Kamain, I'm editor at Nine Arches Press, and I will be your host at tonight's Poetry Cabaret. And what a thrilling and wonderful lineup we have for you tonight. We have the poets Maria Taylor, Gregory Ledbetter, and Rosie Garland, who are going to be our new romantics this evening. All of these poets will be bringing elements of the Gothic and romantic imagination to the fore in their work, celebrating the new books that they have published with Nine Arches Press during the autumn of 2020, and bringing to you, dear audience, dear listeners at home, a little bit of cabaret, a little bit of glamour, and some absolutely wonderful, perfect poetry. It is also National Poetry Day, so please do tweet about this event. You can use the hashtag NPD and do also um, tag in Birmingham Literature Festival. This is their first event this October, so we're absolutely thrilled to be warming up for you uh, wonderful audience members for the rest of their great festival, which due to the current situation with the pandemic is taking place online, but you can find out the full information about Birmingham Literature Festival at their website, www.birminghamliteraturefestival.org.uk. Do check it out. There are plenty more wonderful events and workshops taking place all around the country. So please do have a look for those and um, join in with those as you can as well. So definitely encourage you to do that. And if you're with us on YouTube tonight, please do use the live chat function. We do encourage all of our audience members to join us um, to converse, to take part, um, though we can't all be in, in the room with you this year, at least being on YouTube and having the live chat means we feel the warmth of your presence um, via YouTube. So do take part and there will also be time a little later on for you to do Q&A and to um, ask questions and to take part as well. So we will look forward to that part of the evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome our first wonderful poetry cabaret performer. In true New Romantic style, I will also introduce a little bit about um, our next um, reader, which will be Maria Taylor, and to tell you a little bit about the book as well that she has published recently with Nine Arches Press. Maria Taylor is a British Cypriot poet, critic and reviewer, who has been highly commended in the 2020 Ford Prizes, and published in Rialto, Magma and TLS. She previously published also with Nine Arches Press, a collection which is called Melancrini, which you can buy from us. And this newest collection, which was out just at the start of September is called Dressing for the Afterlife. Also, I was thinking tonight about every single performer in our wonderful cabaret, and if they were a new romantic band from the 1980s or a new romantic track, which one they might be? Well, Maria's book is full of starlets, it is full of film and glamour and wonderful moments where the everyday world is cut through with a little golden glimmer of something quite wonderful, whether that is the observation of Daniel Craig or a moment where we have um, silver screen starlets in their absolute glory. So I think probably Duran Duran's Girls on Film might be the song I might go to if I was thinking about Maria Taylor's poetry. But dear readers, I will let you enjoy and decide which of the many um, new romantic tracks you might have associated with Maria Taylor's wonderful, funny, humane, and ever so slightly just a little bit glamorous poetry. Pour yourself a martini for this one. Please welcome the wonderful poet, Maria Taylor. Hello, hello. So I have my romantic rose. And let's begin. To dress for the afterlife 
step into the precise moment you ended a former existence and zipped yourself into the unknown. Choose a wedding outfit, a pair of overalls, an invisibility cloak, or the national dress of a country you have never visited before. This is how you must learn to breathe again. Um, less glamorous but somewhat more bolshy is my next poem, Woman Running Alone. Um, I do a lot of running, um, but it's kind of about the things you see as you're running. Woman running alone. A woman who follows her own trail and pounds pavements of an ending cities, past statues of forgotten men, fountains, sticky sunshine pouring over tower blocks, past gentrified basement windows where wives hear the washing up howl between their hands past suits on phones and panda-eyed women in doorways with faces that say, I know, I know, tell me about it. These streets where open hands beg for more than is ever offered, where someone's kid is a sleeping bag, where the wolf whistle becomes the wolf and loves worn like musk aftershave, where she forgets who she is, Miss keep on, Miss never going home, neither running away nor running toward anyone, wind sifted, letting the weather sing through her, she who is different to her brothers. The rhythm fills her with flight and her wings, what wings she has. Um, this is about time travel, this next poem. Um, apparently the scientists say that time moves in a figure of eight, but we'll decide, loop. Maybe time moves like a figure of eight, surging forwards then back on itself, Light returns from exploded stars. A grown woman could turn a corner and see herself crying as a girl. News flash, our world ends again. The disappearing forests of childhood disappear again. The path curves. It takes the woman back to a dimly lit bar where she meets the same lover again and again. She risks everything once more. They've already met before they've said a word. So um, film stars. So I have props. I have the delightful Joan Crawford and I have the lovely Daniel Craig. I'm kind of pairing these two poems together now with props seeing as they're both film stars. Now Joan Crawford, um, uh, when she got a bit older, she was a bit annoyed that the parts weren't coming in. So I was trying to visualize um, a scenario. And there she was in the shrunken apartment like Joan Crawford, toy dog on her lap. But there's armor in glamour, a mirror's feisty glare of brow and lips, a shield of heavy floral scent, ardor in her gestures, waiting for the non-existent call and stylish torpor on a sterile afternoon. Amen to the small bronze men with 24 carat soles. They prop open doors where joy might cat sneak in. The 20th century invented the microwave for your solitary meals. Hide Russian water in your flask, Hear new and improved women read scripts meant for you, a memory, a memory of fat cigar smelling fingers, brown trails on your porcelain neck, ghost of stick with me kid, I'll get you in the movies. Should it ring, let the phone ring, let it ring, shut the bedroom door, we'll meditate on diamonds, our best friends. Wear an expensive yoke from Tiffany's. Remember May's words? Hey Bueller, peel me a grape. There isn't any man in the world worth getting lines over. A teardrop pendant sliding over heart or breast, depending on the beholder's eye. So yes, this is a Daniel Craig one and he does get a few outings and I never want my parents to know I've written this poem. Hypothetical. A friend of mine asks me if I'd sleep with Daniel Craig. Before I have time to answer, I'm in bed with Daniel Craig. He's stirring out of sleep, smelling of tobacco vanille. He flatters my performance, asks if I'd like coffee. Hang on, I say, I did not sleep with you, Daniel Craig. This is just a conversational frolic. My friend stands in the corner of my bedroom. You've gone too far, she says. I'm pulling the duvet away from his Hollywood body at exactly the moment my husband enters the room. I say, yes, this is exactly what it looks like, darling, but it's hypothetical, a mere conversational frolic. He's threatening me. There are lawyers in the room. My children begin to cry. I don't even like Daniel Craig. 
it's too late. The sheets are full of secreted evidence. There are forensics in the room covering my body in blue powder, checking my skin for fingerprints. They match Daniel Craig's. He doesn't even know he slept with me. My marriage is a dead goal. My neighbors come into the room shaking heads. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. My husband has drawn lists of all the things he wants to keep. A plasma screen, an Xbox, a collection of muesli colored pebbles from our holidays in Truro. When you loved me, he snaps. My children will see a therapist after school. Daniel Craig is naked in a hypothetical sense, telling me we can make this work. My friend smirks behind a celebrity magazine featuring lurid details of our affair. There are photos. We are on a beach in the Dominican Republic, healthy and tanned, both kicking sand at a playful Joan Collins. I don't even like Daniel Craig, I tell the scene. So after that, the only place to go is prayer. Um, and in my dad's village in Cyprus, there really is an icon that has a great resemblance to the gay urbane poet Frank O'Hara. Uh, no joke. Then I reconsidered prayer. It was unlike me, light years since my Giria Laison, or the cross performed with three digits over skull, stomach, and shoulders. In summer, I went back to the chapel in my father's austere village. It was ironic that St. Minas resembled Frank O'Hara so perfectly. I lit Frank a candle and prayed at an altar of two-headed golden eagles to Our Lady of Infinite Hangovers, to the patron saint of Sitalapram and the holy trinity of vodka, aging and insomnia. When the young priest entered, he was so kind that I almost thought it was okay to be me. If I kept quiet, I could be part of the stone. Once a drunk in a dingy Soho pub mistook the moon I keep on a silver chain around my neck for St. Christopher, I told God about it. I lit another flame for those who journey alone, for the penitent and for the lost. So whilst we're being romantic, um, in Greek, there are many, many words for love. Um, we only seem to have one main word in English, but you can love very differently in Greek. And that poem is a, this poem is a guide to that, learning to love in Greek. They said, beware Eros, though many begin with madness. Learn to fall in love with dancing. This is ludic, the love you felt for skipping ropes or bikes. If Eros and Ludus combine, you may suffer mania, the white blood of the moon that petrifies. Grow philia, the love of football fans on terraces. Chant together, fight with the same heart. If you have children or a puppy, you'll know story ye, it rhymes with B. It sits at kitchen tables, magnetizes crayon drawings to fridges. If you don't have these, you may feel stodier from an old aunt, a mate. A lover might see the child hiding in you from a cowlick of gray that won't be brushed straight. Then philaftia, loving the self, not so easy. For others who dive into pools of themselves, too easy. Be your own best friend. When love moves into a house with a mortgage and enough space for the future, this is Brahma. To stand in love comes after falling. Pray you'll land on your feet. Above all, Arabi, when you forget who you are and take someone's hand. Um, okay, so just a few more. Um, this is a kind of love poem to my family because at the time when I was younger, um, you know, you know how you feel about your family, but now I miss my family and I miss the fact that I don't speak Greek to people very often. And I miss the flats in Kentish town and that kind of freedom we had back in the day, the distance. My family never got the hang of England, arriving in London, scattering lives into flats, hollering from balconies instead of olive groves. It's my name being screamed over the estate. My aunt wants me home for dinner. She's busy tying mint into bouquets with yarn, willing the stalks to dry in weak sunshine. From the ground, she looks besieged by foliage with leaves and herbs growing from old cans and empty margarine tubs. My uncle's indoors persuading Baba to another shot of brandy. The volume turned up on his satellite TV with a band playing Sammy Girl for a wedding. 
When neighbors complain, he ignores them, turning irritations into nimble dance steps, a gurgle of B-flat clarinets to guide him. I'll enter the room with a bag of school books, curdling with embarrassment at his display. Years later, I throw open my windows to rain, knowing my aunt's echoes won't travel the distance. I'm here, I say to water. Can't you shout any louder? Um, this is another kind of love poem, but again, love poem for babies. Um, and I had twins, twin babies, and then they got older and I forgot what it was like to have babies. Um, so literally a stranger's baby crying reminds me of that. And that's very, brings back all that love. What it was like. When the stranger's baby cries, my body remembers the shrill, tuneless song of need. It remembers endless nights of cat and dog rain. It remembers our road falling asleep as we forgot to remember us. That summer, clothes stopped remembering to fit. We'd look through thin curtains and remember the sun mimicked by sodium light. I remember the feel of warm, sleep-suited limbs still breathe in their powdery smell. The stranger I used to be lives in the present tense now. The baby fidgets on her chest like a rabbit. Then he's calm. His blue eyes gnaw on me for a moment till his head's at rest. The frail, dreaming head of infancy that only knows a need for love and milk that won't remember any of this. So to finish off, we're back in the movies. Um, this poem always makes me laugh because 2020 didn't turn out quite the way uh, I think we all envisaged it might. Um, remember all that best year ever, all that? Um, so this was the last poem I wrote, and yet strangely it's become one of the first poems, it is one of the first poems in the book. Um, so I was imagining that the 2020s might be a bit like the 1920s, and I could be a silent film goddess. Um, it's not worked out that way. But in poetry, we can dream. I began the 2020s as a silent film goddess. On the 1st of January, I threw away my smartphone and wrote a letter to my beau in swirling ink. I bobbed my hair, wore a cloche hat and shimmied right into town for juleps. I became Clara, I became Louise. When I became a vamp, the boys fell dead at my feet. I threw petals over their heads. I dined on prosperity sandwiches and sidecars, leaving restaurants with a sugar-rimmed mouth. In summer, I was a night-blooming flower. By autumn, I was a hangover. Winter made me a Wall Street crash. Talking pictures were my ruin. At last, I had a voice, but no one wanted to hear. Forgotten sisters, oh Vilma, oh Norma, oh May, a musty headdress of peacock feathers. Defiant silence. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Maria. That was a wonderful reading. And just um, to add, I think though we might not be the silent film goddesses, we've perhaps become the live cast film goddesses of our time. So maybe the, the 2020s will be when we reinvent that a little bit online in our digital way. But thank you for such wonderful poems. They shimmer and they glimmer and they're all part of this brand new book. Dressing for the Afterlife by Maria Taylor. So I urge anyone who's enjoyed that to head out and find that from our website or from your best independent bookshop. Um, thank you very much, Maria. Um, our next reader this evening will be Gregory Ledbetter. Just before I welcome Gregory up to the stage on our wonderful virtual Nine Arches New Romantics Poetry Cabaret, just to tell you a little bit about Greg and a little bit about his poetry. Um, Gregory Ledbetter, is a poet based in Birmingham and his new book, Maskwork, has just been published by Nine Arches. It's his second poetry collection following on from The Fetch, which also last year found a wonderful parallel life as a piece of music and piano composed by pianist Eric McElroy and performed last year in Oxford, which you can also find online on YouTube if you search for The Fetch. Gregory is Professor of Poetry at Birmingham City University and also has pamphlets including The Body in the Well from Happenstance Press. He's also published widely on romantic poetry and thought, so makes him a perfect guest for this evening and for our wonderful mix of Gothic 
and romantic poetry, which we are really um, indulging and enjoying in tonight. And yet again, I was drawn to wonder if Greg had been a new romantic band or new romantic song, which one we might have chosen from our 1980s jukebox for him. I have to say, I think I was probably moving towards Visage and Fade to Grey because there are elements in Greg's poems which mix both theatricality and mystery and beautifully work at the fringes of things, at the liminal edges perhaps between the imagined and the real and the mythological. So I felt that those haunting, brilliant poems of his might have a little bit in common with Fate Grey, so we will see. But in the meantime, will you please give a warm cabaret welcome on National Poetry Day to Gregory Ledbetter. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Jane. Uh, that was a lovely, lovely welcome. Uh, and yeah, I like the visage uh, connection. I think I can go with that. I, I should have put some black eyeliner on, I think, for this evening, but I, you know, I didn't think of that. But um, in fact, you know that word visage or visage as I'm going to pronounce it in this poem, it does feature in the first poem of the book, the title poem of the book, Mask Work, which kind of strikes its opening note really, and its emphasis on going beyond the literal, beyond what we might already be familiar with, uh, a deviation from the norm into another way of seeing, uh, one that's only possible in and through the imaginary. So I'm going to read that poem for you first. Mask work. To teach the mask I make to tell the truth, I wear it as my own. Feel its weight tilt when it sees the first earthly thing it loves suffer in its infant being. One mask passes to another, the face that it has learned. Still, it makes no sound, even as its senses sow their trance, where what would be its language grows. Only when my life has done its work, and the mask knows more than I could say without its visage, then I take it off. It wears my voice. The mask speaks. And so to, uh, well, further into the imaginary, um, the second poem in the collection, in fact, uh, which is called Musician. And I like to make lyric myths, um, as in these next two poems I'm going to read, both of which are spoken by mysterious characters, I suppose, known only by their voice and what they say. So this first one is called Musician. That night plays back scratched vinyl, but here's my fiddle. The lane led way out and I went, though dark had spilt and shook the stars in black water where I walked. Dressed for day and led by story, nothing more. The spirits I'd swilled warmed my blood, but the cold drank. I knew I didn't have long before the blue moon stilled my flesh to crystal. I heard it come, the air at work, the medium lipping my ears and mouth. Spittled fingers circling my skin to make it ring. I felt the bow I'd hung at my back grow taut, and the raw strings of what you call my violin thrill for the kiss. They braced to meet and make a voice. And then I was there. The blind road emptied into a field 
as if where I stepped a sudden breath had blown the earth to a sphere of glass. I met that world's musician, a white moth alight within its whisper. One of us said, play, and I did, and what it spoke, I learned even as it danced me to the bone in sound that shivered to a meat dawn. I woke under dew in open ground. I had no home. You don't have to believe me, but I can tell your body heard. The song gets through. That's how I got this tune on my tongue. Music, um, the fact and the idea of music features strongly in the book and uh, as in that last poem and in a different way in this next one, which is called Metaphysician. After she died, my grandmother told me that I was a healer. You could say that. I retired at 40. It's hard to stay true to the truth of a dream, but I have my work. Let me clear you a space by the fire. I like a room with a touch of Prometheus. It reminds me of my purpose here, alone with only his gift and the broken clay of human faces. The antique globe in the corner is as close as I get to the world that I left, the dysfunction I failed to solve for all I had learned from my own wound. An astrologer once told me that Venus was conjunct with Chiron in the house of my calling, a trinity of love, hurt and healing in my hands. All I will say is, I recognised the person she described. Here we are, in my cave of mysteries. I repair beautiful things that are still, or silent with age or neglect. Things that, like language, others have made in time out of mind, that now might stoop broke-necked, or try to see with one glass eye. It's a delicate task, but the results can astonish even me. Last week, I woke an ibis made of silver and mother of pearl and heard it speak of the Da'at of Kabbalah before I watched it go, anxious as a parent for a child. All my favorites house a demon. One, Baroque as a fairground fortune teller, I call the poet, he can only speak one poem, and then only if I lend him my breath. It's a good poem, you'd enjoy it. Others play music like you've never heard, as if Orpheus really could make stone stir. So you see, I haven't given up on what my grandmother told me after she died though I've grown as strange as my art. You are the first to wonder who I am. So for you, I will do something different. Give me the music box you have brought. Thank you. I can see that it's close to your heart. Sometimes the fix is in the floor. There, open it, listen. The dancer, lithe as a living flame, is the prime mover. Everything around her rises to dance. Um, in my previous collection that Jane mentioned there, The Fetch, um, there's a, a sequence on my father and his um, 
the, his illness toward the end of his life uh, with, um, with vascular dementia. And um, this next poem I'm going to read you is a kind of uh, coda, really, to that sequence. And um, also involves another theme found in mask work, uh, our relationship to technology, um, told through a personal history. And this poem is called Personal Computing. I slot the rewound cassette into the deck. Type load, press play. The monitor flickers its glitch rainbow, begins to unscramble its data with a sound like a signal scratched from the depth of space. I am maybe nine years old and you, dad, can't be far away. This is a Commodore 64 its console the color of praline fondant, the second computer in the quiet revolution you brought to our home, that for us had begun with the VIC-20, 20, 20 kilobytes of read-only memory, new words with their strange promise, the hope hardwired in the dream of tech. And that, I think, is what you loved in these, the greater human good that we might make with them, the computer as a kind of friend to help our thinking grow. The next one you bought was the Amiga 500 with one megabyte and a built-in disk drive. And that felt like the future. The revolution got faster. After the Commodores, you built your own but eventually the Windows PC won out, leaving the house a clutter of computer archeology. span Look at us now. You and I might have discussed the quantum mechanics of dementia, how you can be here and not here at once. If I had kept those old computers, might they one day remake you from skin cells smudged from your thumb on the mold of your mouse. Left click your mind to life again. But it wouldn't be you. The future has come and gone. I am still watching the flickering screen, waiting for all we have lost to load. Um, now for another uh, poem on loss or absence of a kind. Um, this time, not so much a, a haunting by what was, but what, what never was, what might have been, I suppose. Mm. I call this poem, Kara. She has no tongue. It withered without her being born. I might have sung to her, heard her sing back a scuffed phonograph of baby speech, foreign as a language never formed, but mouthing at the gauze of being. Not even a memory of skin brushes mine. Her absence is so soft to touch. She hides too well. Not even a shadow could find her, and only her mother and father would look. It must be her hunger that I feel in her place, though I am full and she has nowhere to feed. The sway of words will not move her silence or make her walk. There is no earth to lay her. She is not as real. As the dead. She is barely a thing that might have been my daughter or son. And uh, lastly, um, a poem that turns to the natural world, um, the ecology we inhabit and in which we participate. 
And our relation, I suppose, to the more than human, and the relation of language to the more than human, too. So thank you very much for listening. This last one I'm going to read is called Doe. Inside the green rhythm, below rippling leaves, turned from the squint of a sickly heat, the doe and I were breath, held in exchange for a sense, not yet our own, but heard in a call from the nerve of this wood, spoken as a bird that lit the feathered shade we stepped into a space we fell and flew towards each time we stopped to tilt an ear to listen for the trail of the other's voice. I tried to speak the name for friend and the sound came back as the bark of trees point blank at my skin but let me slip like a finger through their silent folds, teaching my touch to hatch like an egg. Don't be afraid, I almost said, if not to myself, to the verging dead, bone dust scattered in bluebells, death bells knelling death's end in the sow of the wild that led her and me sly as lovers into this secret taught as a web. We opened like flowers, our scent thickening air moist with the dew of our lungs, limbed with antennae fed on the dark light of the radiant body, a foot or sweet with rot where it fell. We flickered like a tongue from an adder's jaw and flared at our meeting, revealed. The doe startled from her mottled bed, as if this time I had spoken her true name and fled. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregory Ledbetter, for such a wonderful reading and for those haunting, moving and often unsettling poems, which really get to grips with the atmosphere of the Gothic romantic imagination in lots of ways, in a very contemporary way as well. Thank you so much. Um, the next performer that I will welcome to our stage this evening will be Rosie Garland. Just before I do, just to recap that this event is an event for Birmingham Literature Festival with Nine Arches Press. I'm Jane Kamein. And to let you know that there is a great deal of wonderful events taking place digitally and online throughout the next week or so with Birmingham Literature Festival. If you'd like to find out about the workshops, events, and other things that you can take part in, readings and um, live talks and so on online, please visit www.birminghamliteraturefestival.org. We'll also post that in the chat for you to follow as well from YouTube, but do check it out. And we're absolutely delighted. Um, a great many thanks to the festival for hosting our wonderful um, poetry cabaret this evening. So our final reader for this evening will be Rosie Garland, and then we will also take um, a short bit of Q&A. So please do store up your questions and use the live chat on YouTube to post any questions you have for our wonderful poets who have been performing as part of tonight's cabaret. Um, Rosie Garland has just published a poetry collection, or was just about to publish, I should say, a poetry collection with Nine Arches Press. It is this marvellous, wonderful book, which is called What Girls Do in the Dark. It takes flight, it takes us into space. It's a wonderful collection where heavenly bodies and the universe collide. And we're very excited to be publishing this book as part of our autumn trio of poets um, next week. So um, just to tell you a little bit as well about Rosie herself. Um, Rosie is a novelist, a poet and a singer with the March um, post-punk band, The March Violets. And she has a passion for language, which was nurtured by public libraries. Her debut novel, The Palace of Curiosities, was nominated for both the Desmond Elliott and the Polari First Book Prize. And her next novel, Vixen, was a Green Carnation Prize nominee. Her latest novel is The Night Brother. She is an inaugural writer in residence at the John Rylands Library in Manchester. And in 2019, she was selected by Val McDermott 
as one of the 10 most compelling LGBTQI plus writers working in the UK. It's really wonderful to be um, welcoming Rosie tonight. And I must admit, I did consider whether there was an appropriate 80s new wave, new romantic band that I could mention with, um, in relation to Rosie, but really no comparison is necessary. As I've already mentioned, um, Rosie is a vocalist with the wonderful post-punk gothic band, the March Violets. So what I'd like you to imagine instead is that we're going to take a little handful of sparkling ultraviolet glitter. We're going to throw it out into the cosmos, see it settle in space amongst the stars and the planets and the universe and there form the poems that we're going to enjoy tonight. Will you please give a huge round of applause and welcome our final reader for this evening's National Poetry Day, New Romantics Poetry Cabaret, Rosie Garland. Take it away, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thank you, all the other poets. How absolutely marvellous to be here. And um, it is really wonderful to be reading here tonight. Yeah, am I unmuted? Great. Um, thank you. And one of the reasons I, yeah, of course, goths are supposed to be drawn to the darkness. And one of the reasons I'm drawn to the darkness is because that's when you see the stars. Um, the stars are always there, but we can only see them at night. And uh, so that's why there are lots of planets and stars in this collection. And um, I'm going to start with the first poem in the collection. Um, yes, I am a published writer, and a lot of people think that because I'm a published writer, I never get any rejections anymore. And uh, this is not true, au contraire, everybody. Um, and so I'm gonna start off with a letter of rejection from a black hole. We're touched by your desire to join our great work of dismembering the fabric of time and matter. We can't blame you for wanting to hide in nothing and note the ways you've snapped off pieces of yourself to prove you're serious. However, we wonder if you've misunderstood our purpose, the difference between obliteration of the cosmos and the spirit. You've been smothering your radiance for so long, it's become a system of belief that you're cored with lead, incapable of anything but borrowed light, or in a destructive twist of logic that impressed the selection panel, brilliance is only permitted to serve others' needs. You have the right to glow. It's not your duty to light up anyone else's day. We urge you to reconsider, wish you well, and suggest steering clear of holes. Thank you. Um, Having said that we're going to be talking about stars, I'm now going to change completely. Um, I am a secret medievalist. Um, and um, I mean, I do love a virgin martyr who doesn't. And uh, one of my favorite virgin martyrs is of course, Catherine of Alexandria, she of the Catherine wheel. And um, she was phenomenally and fiercely intelligent um, and unmarried. What could possibly go wrong? St. Catherine. It starts as a joke, the one about the kitchen and what you're doing out of it. All smiles, splay of knees, bulge of crotches, mutter of heavens, these women, why have a dog and bark for it? Keep your eyes open for the tick of an index finger shoving spectacles up a sweaty nose. 
keep running circles round their gnawed faith. Jab and faint, jab and faint. They will kill you for being cleverer, worse than laughing at their dicks. You know all of that, but won't stop, can't. You didn't read the Library of Alexandria to bat your eyelashes and keep stum. This isn't about God. The stained glass legends of broken wheels, the barrel load of miracles or the dinner plate halo, they will nail to your head. Under the gospel, the truth of it, woman answers back, ends up dead. So, hmm. a little refreshment. Oh, I should have said, um, yes, um, Maria had a lovely, lovely rose earlier, tremendously romantic. I brought a bottle of vampire vodka all the way from Transylvania. <laughs> so uh, you can't really get more romantic than that. So, uh, right, uh, back to stars, back to planets. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but 2020 has been a bit of a funny old year. Um, and this poem is for anybody who feels that they have been tipped off their axis. Um, something I found when I was um, reading and researching for the science, I would like to point out that I failed science at school quite heroically and have come to it quite late in life. Uh, so when I was, um, I was really comforted to discover that actually the earth wobbles, our own planet, is always on the wobble. It does not have this orderly orbit. That's only what you see in the pictures. And um, I think that's rather comforting that the earth is um, tipped off its axis as well. So this is called planetary wobble. Earth refuses to draw clean circles. In a seven-year itch, she shimmies round the sun with an inbuilt deviation from the true. What is truth? Not colouring inside the lines or the fine print of little laws. Her fractal swing delights in shapes that swerve off kilter a rock and rolling calligraphy of bad behaviour that swirls, uh, damn it, <laughs> that swirls along the scroll of orbit. You see, I tilted then as well. She sloshes oceans from neap to spring, a dizzy, uncircled dervish swirl close to God. I am a whipped top that spins only a moment before it topples from equilibrium. The gravity of doubt skews my axis and I can't stand straight. I will go on, tilted. Thank you. I'm imagining the um, rapturous applause. Um, right, so we've had uh, some science, we've had some astro astronomy, astrophysics even, and we've had a bit of theology thrown into the mix. But where, I hear you say, where is the weirdness, Rosie? Um, I, I hear you ask, well, um, ask no longer, here cometh the weirdness. Um, when Jane and I, Jane, the lovely, lovely Jane Kermain, uh, were editing this collection, she asked me um, about this piece. What is the creature in this piece? And the answer is the title. They are an oddness. 
when he gets home, he slides you into a goldfish bowl. You think there's no way you can fit what with the tail and fronds, but the water accommodates like a glove. Morning and evening, he shakes a plastic tub. The food falls in a drift of salty confetti. You flick your clever tongue and catch each flake. You grow long and sleek. He has to move you into the sink by the end of the week, the bath. He feeds you from a tin of sardines, holds out a fork, says, here comes the aeroplane. When your lips close around the tines, you taste sweat on his fingers. You eat and grow. Your tentacles climb the tiles around the tub. You pull the floor with slime. At night, you rest your head upon his knee. He combs your hair and whiskers, smooths your frills where they have wedged against the sides of the bath. You wrap your tongue around him, squeeze till he gasps. You watch him gazing in wonder at the marks you leave. His tongue is small and lacking in muscle. Thank you again. Yeah. Right, let us move back to light. Um, Northern light. Um, I was with my partner and we were driving over the North York Moors a while ago and um, I spotted this really bizarre dirty light in the sky, kind of orangey brown. Um, so of course we had to stop and find out what it was and discovered that um, the Aurora Borealis can be seen as far south as Yorkshire and that's what it was. Uh, none of that flouncy fluorescent green nonsense this was th these were yorkshire lights you think it's a trick of the clouds but this is no will o the wisp that shimmers into nothing no sleight of hand sleek flicker that plucks a penny from your ear while it picks your pocket these are slow lights Sure lights, built for the long haul. Banked fires of bronze peat to outlast winter. Rusty with the mucked up brass of shuttered shops, stoppered coal mines, empty wallets. A flag steeped in bloody mindedness, the opposite of surrender. Steady as the rain that grinds the Pennines, true as the Leeds and Liverpool Canal with its deep cut through moors marked out with sheep daubed, daubed red. It takes less time than you think to adjust glare adapted eyes, relearn the lessons of iron light reclaim night vision. And finally, um, there's always got to be a poem about a dog. So I'm going to finish with my poem about a dog. And um, for anyone who owns a dog, you will already know that dogs are heavenly bodies. Uh, which is why this last piece is called Biography of a Comet in the Body of a Dog. All flap and gallop off the leash. It careers in a wild orbit around the solar system. The sweep of its tail makes skittles of doubt. 
it digs holes through the wounded parts of joy to the other side of despair. Every time I toss hope away, it brings it back, drops it at my feet, tongue drooling a glittering rope. On cinder nights when breath knocks hollow breath, it soars, heart on fire, chasing squirrel stars it can never catch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosie, for that wonderful reading, for your galactical and ma magical poems, for your feminist fables and your starstruck science and astronomy that fill those wonderful poems. And just to say, um, What Girls Do in the Dark is published by Nine Arches Press and will be out next week, next Thursday. So um, if you pre-order it, you can pre-order through our website. Um, and uh, thank you so much. That was just such a, a wonderful, absorbing and beautiful reading. Um, it's been a wonderful evening in our poetry cabaret and I hope a fitting way to celebrate National Poetry Day. But don't go anywhere. We are going to have a short Q&A with all of our guest poets tonight. And I'm going to invite anybody who's watching um, us on YouTube, please do use the live chat facility to ask any questions you'd like to ask of our writers. So if you post them in there, we will pick them up and um, we will relay them to our writers here and we will um, have a interesting and um, further conversation about their work. So I wonder if I might take the liberty perhaps of um, asking the first question of tonight's guests. Um, so I'm just going to bring us all back so that everybody um, is on the screen as well. So hello, Maria, Greg and Rosie. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask if it's, um, if you don't mind me sort of being a little bit cheeky while our, our readers think of, and our listeners, our audience think of the question that they might like to ask of you. Um, I wanted to ask, as our theme tonight is the new romantics, um, as contemporary poets, what do the original romantic poets, um, what kind of correspondence or response or relation do you think your work might have with the original romantic poets um, in, the, in your own contemporary way? I'm quite interested in how that might reflect into your work or what connections you might think there are. Um, which, uh, should we go in reverse or order of our readings? Perhaps I could ask Rosie first if that's all right and we'll... Um. Oh, Rosie. Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Yes, no, no pressure. Um, well, um, I mean, there are obvious connections. Like um, they were passionate. They wore big, fluffy white shirts, um, and they were interested in the supernatural um, and you know and folklore. And I can see connections with all of that. But um, I. <sighs> And I can see that that's got resonances in my own stuff, but I also find them quite annoying because they're um, they're complete. They seem to be opposed to the rational, and um, I, I I'm a big science geek. And um, also the other thing that I find quite annoying about them is that um, they all had cleaners and cooks and people to scrub those lovely floofy white shirts of them to keep them clean, and um, so. I feel quite a lot of tension about the Romantic Poets. Obviously, they were fabulous, um, but also they were rather annoying. And I hope I'm not the latter of them. Sorry, Greg, would you like to go next? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, um... You know, I, I mean, it's a dangerous question for me because, of course, I, you know, this is my research specialism is <laughs> the romantic. So, um, you know, I, I could do you an essay, which I won't do right now. Um, well, I, I suppose, you know, first and foremost, it, it, it was reading Coleridge as a teenager that really, uh, you know, opened up all sorts of kind of synaptic explosions uh, in my in my brain you know um and opened up various pathways that i suppose i've found myself following ever since and um i, I you know yeah I, to keep it brief i will say probably that new relation to a new kind of consciousness in relation to the natural world um and and it's and, and it's wonder um 
but also to the transnatural, you know, which is a word Coleridge uses in, in one of his notebooks, um, well, once or twice actually, um, you know, to our creative powers, our powers to alter and, and transform. And I suppose um, the big claims they made for poetry, um, that connection between poetry and metaphysics, uh, you, you know, how, well, the intimate relation between poetry and the substance and even the very possibility of our feeling and our knowing and our being. Um, and you, I, I, I suppose all of this is kind of summed up for me in, in something that Coleridge said about Shakespeare, who he kind of idealized, um, but he described Shakespeare in one of his lectures uh, as a nature humanized, a genial understanding, directing self-consciously a power and an implicit wisdom deeper even than consciousness. And I find that quite thrilling. <laughs> Thank you very much, Greg. Um, Maria, would you um, like to respond? Um, okay, so many moons ago, I did an English degree. And I have to say, after doing the med, you know, the early stuff, I actually woke up when the romantics came on the scene. Um, they got me straight away. And we've been talking about the transcendence and all the kind of the romance of the romantics. But actually, what I really liked about them was their ordinariness as well that they have this kind of conflict between the ordinary and the extraordinary. And they wrote poems about normal things, but in extraordinary ways. And they weren't these kind of big blousy kind of like old school poets who were going on about golden chariots and what have you. And I think we owe a lot to the romantics because I think they had a kind of style which I think has really shaped how we write now and since. So I've got a lot of time for the romantics. And although he's not a poet, I always had a little thing for William Hazlitt, although I don't think he was a particularly nice person, but you know, he was kind of dangerous in that kind of romantic way. So yeah, yeah, I don't think we'd be here if it wasn't for those gentlemen and ladies, of course. Let's, let's hear it for Mary Shelley too. So yes, and Dorothy Wordsworth. Let's not forget Dorothy because she did a lot of William's editing. So she's probably had a, a lot to do with what he wrote. So yes, yeah, we love them, yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. And um, it ties into what Rosie was saying too about the people in the background also with the, the romantic poets and how we tend to think about um, the core romantic poets. It's really important to remember both Dorothy Wordsworth and Mary Shelley too yeah. as part of of that. Um, that was quite a serious and deep question for our first one. So uh, uh, while our uh, questions are just coming in, I wanted to ask a very quick question of you each as well, that's probably slightly more frivolous. And that is, if your poems in your latest books were a cocktail, what would they contain? Um, at the moment, fading rose petal, autumn fading rose julep, all my petals are falling off, so I, I put them in a glass, so yeah. And you do actually have some cocktails mentioned in your collection in your 2020s poems. Yeah, cocktails are like little poems, aren't they? There, there's something I, I like, I mean, I'm not sitting around drinking cocktails all day, unfortunately, but I do like the sort of magic of them and the sort of ingredients that go into them, like potions and how they have a kind of romantic otherworldliness to them, even if they make you feel a little sick the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a cabaret so this does feel like a space in which were we all in the same room we might be you know possibly mixing a sidecar or a mint julep um to, to to toast each other and to toast those wonderful poems with um rosie would you like to go next um well um obviously i've got my transylvanian vodka at my side um <laughs> I'd, I'd probably um have a uh, kia royale um, because there's something deep bloody red at the bottom of it and then it's all topped up with champagne and so it's a mixture of bubbles and blood. Oh, and a little bit galactic as well there's you know hey. shimmering and sparkling of deep space within those little yeah. tiny bubbles so I like yeah. that. Greg what would be in your cocktail for your collection your new poems? 
Oh, you've got me thinking here. I, I yeah, I mean, I, I like I like the sort of depth that gin gives a cocktail. You know, a gin-based cocktail. I like that, and and I also like something quite fragrant in a cocktail. So I'm I can feel myself gravitating towards a Negroni, something like that. Um, but then again, you see, uh, I was also thinking about maybe some strange combination of Benedictine, Armagnac uh, and Champagne. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, let's do it. Let's arrange an evening. Everyone here is invited. Everyone who's <laughs> listening now, um, you know, we, we, can, we can do this, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we've got some wonderful questions coming in from our audience tonight who have been tuning in and listening. Thank you so much to everybody who's joined us. It's been lovely having you um, join in and be a part of our event. And um, we've got a question here from Jonathan Davidson for Gregory Ledbetter. Jonathan says, which of the many masks in his poems does Greg feel the most comfortable with? Oh, now, um, uh... Well, out of this book, uh, yeah. oh, that's a tough one, Jonathan. Um, I think I'd probably say, you know, I haven't read it this evening, so you're just going to have to buy the book, folks. But uh, there's a poem near the end of the book called Consistori del Gai Saber. And um, that is a kind of um, fantasia on, well, the speaker of that poem I suppose that's the mask I, I, I feel closest to. It's a fantasia on the Consistori del Gai Saber, which was a real thing established in Toulouse in the 14th century to um, foster uh, and, and cultivate uh, lyric poetry, I suppose. Um, but I do something a little different with that. So it's an entirely sort of imaginary Consistori that I write about there. But... Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of me in that, I think. Thank you, Greg. Um, we've got another question here for um, Rosie from Molly Russell. Molly says, "I have a question for Rosie. I'm a goth and a poet, and I've never seen another goth or gothic poet before. Do you find there's much crossover between your gothic sensibilities and the work you write?" Um, well, yes, not so much a crossover as sort of like a deep imbuing. Um, I couldn't separate my sort of gothic sensibilities from who I am, really. They, I don't do it as a pose. It's just something that's part of me. Um, I guess one of the romantic writers that I first discovered was Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and I first... Um, I was introduced to Edgar Allan Poe at the age of nine um, by an American aunt who obviously had different ideas about what constituted improving literature for small children. And uh, good for her uh, because something chimed at the age of nine and I thought, ah, it was the pit and the pendulum that did it for me. At the age of nine, I thought, I've just realized something very important. I can be terrified and enthralled and love it at the same time. And, and so, uh, yeah, so that's my, that's how far back my, my sort of Gothic roots go, you could say. So yeah, I've, it's not so much a crossover as just part and parcel, I'd say as an answer. I hope that helps. Thank you very much, Rosie. And um, David Bowler has another question for you, um, which I'll actually ask of all of you, because it's a really good yeah. question. Um, David asks, who influenced you in writing poetry? Um, Rosie, if you'd like to start and then um, oh, maybe okay. we go. I'll go quickly. Um, it's interesting to hear that um, Maria also, um, in a very much earlier existence, did an English degree. So did I. Um, although I was kind of at the other end of the spectrum, I woke up when Beowulf was um, being taught. And uh, so... My, uh, some, one of my influences, one of my many influences, are the, are the rhythms of Anglo-Saxon poetry. Um, that was uh, one of my first great loves at university. I couldn't understand why everyone else didn't really get excited by Beowulf. Although apparently now it's very fashionable with all the young people. Uh, hurrah. So um, yeah, that's a big influence for me. Thank you, 
Thank you, Rosie and Maria, would you like to? Oh, crikey. Um, I always go blank whenever I hear this question. Um, but I think Kavafi, I love Kavafi. I think there is not a more perfect poem than Ithaca. <laughs> I love Ithaca um, because it just speaks to me on the on a level where Ithaca isn't just a place, it's an ideal, it's where are you spending your life trying to get to. I love that searchingness of Kavafi. I think his poetry is very, very universal. And I think it was actually very sensual as well. And I like, I like what he did with language very much. Um, but generally, I get a bit blank when people ask me that question because suddenly everything I've ever read rushes through my head and then I say something really strange normally. So I'm going to stick with Kavafi tonight. <laughs> um, and, and for me, well, I, I suppose I've already, I've already mentioned uh, the name. Uh, if I had to pick, pick one that, that really... Um, yeah, opened my mind to the possibilities of poetry and, and had um, an enormous uh, impact and continues to really on, on my thinking about poetry. Um, and, it, and it's Samuel Taylor of Coleridge. Um, you know, I, I suppose he's the closest I've, I've had to having a, a mentor, even though he's been dead since 1834, um, you know, in poetry. Um, you must always pay attention to the dead. They have a lot of interesting things to say. And, um, and he certainly does. And he's so interested in everything. And it's that interconnectedness of poetry with literally everything in his own thinking that I, that I think I particularly caught hold of and that, that fascinated me and, uh, as I say, continues to do so. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take one more question from the audience and then um, finish off with a final question um, for all of you as well. Um, and then that will be the end of this evening, but it's been wonderful doing this Q and A. Um, the question from um, Emma Caton for Rosie, when writing poetry, how different do you think the creative process is in comparison to your novels? Um. It, it is different. Um, I guess um, one, of, one of the very quick ways to um, distinguish it is that writing a novel is like running a marathon. Um, it, it takes a, a different kind of stamina. Um, whereas writing a, well, creating a, believe me, creating a poem can take as long as writing a novel, but you end up with far fewer words on the page. Um, with a novel, I can spread out and live with characters for years and um, inhabit their entire lives, sometimes from the beginning to the end. Um, whereas with a poem, it's very much more um, a cameo, it's a snapshot. It's a it's a it's a small nugget. Um, I also write flash fiction, and although it's called flash fiction, I really do feel that there is a lot more in common with flash fiction and poetry than there is with flash fiction and longer form fiction like a novel. Um, and in turn, and actually, I'm I, I get I'm really happy to write in lots of different forms. Um, Increasingly, I'm, I, I, I don't ask a, a question about what it is. Is it a poem? Is it a flash? Is it a piece of creative nonfiction? Is it something in between? Generally, I know if it's a novel because it goes on for 92,000 words. Um, and that's a, good, and that's, that's a good way. Generally, poems don't go on for that many words. Um, but otherwise, I'm, I'm a lot more flexible about what something is. Thank you, Rosie. And thank you to our audience for such wonderful and thoughtful questions. It's been a real pleasure to have your involvement um, this evening. Um, one final question from me for our um, poets tonight. Um, these are strange and uncertain and um, unsettling times. What for you as writers and as readers is the value in imaginative spaces? What are the power or the importance of those imaginative spaces to you?
whoever wants to dive in first, go for it. <laughs> well, I, I'll dive in and, and say, I suppose it's, it's freedom. Um, you know, it, it's, it is a, a realm of freedom. And, and I suppose by focusing on language and focusing on um, all that it implies about the way we order our lives, the way we think, the way we feel, uh, the way we know uh, anything, um, as I said, I, um, when you, once you start to become more active in your relationship to language, in a way that poetry and other literary arts encourages, encourages you to, um, it kind of activates that freedom as well. So it, it, it cultivates freedom, it creates more freedom. So I suppose that's, that's one cardinal value for me. Mm -hmm. I'm finding that um, through this year, writing is helping me keep steady and um, keep connected. And um, I find it helps me imagine a way through this. The imagination is helping me get through this because I'm imagining, and as I'm imagining, I'm writing. I'm writing a path through this and forwards um, and that is having more of a positive impact on my mental health than I can even begin to describe. Yeah, I've, I've had a sort of backwards journey. I think when the world started, I mean, the world's always been a bit mad, but when things started to go very odd around the 2015 mark and we had those terrible images of, you know, things going on in Syria and what have you, started to wonder I'm just writing poetry what what does you know and we seem to have gone through this amazing last five years and you know at the moment we're going through this terrible pandemic and now I think it's actually the most important thing and I can say that and I can say that 100% because if you don't have that if you don't have your art your poetry music film books novels whatever it is I don't know how you can survive quite frankly it, I think it's the most important thing. And I think we've all realised how important the arts are this year. And we owe a debt to the arts. And also, I wish I had a little bit more time. I mean, things have been fairly intense in our household with work and kids at home from school. But um, yeah, it's made me really appreciate the writing time. And having a book out has made me think, wow, I actually wrote a book. <laughs> when did I do that? So yeah, it's been, it's, it saved me this year. Definitely. Thank you so much for the answers and what a good and important note to probably leave our event on as well. Um, I'm, I'd like to thank everybody who's taken part this evening to Gregory Ledbetter, Maria Taylor and Rosie Garland, who in this wonderful cabaret club tonight have been our special guests. Thank you for your wonderful, moving, galactic and deeply glamorous readings. It has been just a delight to be in your presence. Thank you to Birmingham Literature Festival, to um, Chantal Edwards for organising and for inviting us to Olivia Chapman as well, and to all the team at Writing West Midlands who helped make the festival possible. And we thank you very much for inviting us to be part of um, the festival's launch this year. So thank you very much to Birmingham Literature Festival. Find out more about their online events at their website, birminghamliteraturefestival.org. Um, and finally say a huge thank you as well to Angela, who um, hasn't been on screen, but has been in the background. She works for Nine Arches as a marketing and publicity officer, and she's been supporting all of our um, technical things this evening. So a huge thank you to Angela for that too. And um, thank you, last of all, to our wonderful audience. To end the evening, we're all going to applaud and then we will vanish from your screens. But not without saying thank you very much. Good night. Take care. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>